FDR and the Great Depression, Part 1, The First New Deal. On October 22, 1929, the headline of the Washington Post newspaper read, Expect Bull Market. Any of you who might be business majors or familiar with such things know that a bull market is a good thing. It means that the stock market has been on the rise and that prosperity is on the march in the country. And so the Washington Post was predicting continued good times and continued prosperity. We've heard in previous lectures about the so-called Roaring Twenties and the prosperity of the 1920s, and so we're just reaching the end of that period and that decade. Exactly one week later, on the date known as Black Tuesday, October 29th, 1929, the stock market crashed. It was the worst single day in the history of the market. You see the newspaper headline there, simply a disastrous day for anyone who owned stock. Uh, entire fortunes were lost in the space of just a few hours, and of course, panic set in. And so the Washington Post was hopelessly wrong in its prediction. This must be one of the all-time great wrong predictions. Uh, and yet, the Washington Post was hardly alone in its expectations for continued good times. The nation had been so immersed in prosperity over the 1920s that there was a growing feeling that we had somehow overcome hard times. We had overcome poverty and we had overcome uh, dips in the stock market. Of course, all of those sorts of expectations and predictions were wrong. Another thought related to the fall and the plunge in the stock market is that why did it lead to a depression, and in this case, the Great Depression? The stock market has risen and fallen uh, routinely uh, throughout American history, and yet rarely are such dips followed by severe depressions. And uh, in the case of the Great Depression, we have a unique situation. And so how is it that the stock market itself came to be linked to the, the rest of the economy and in the case of the Great Depression to this deep, profound, societal depression? Uh, we're going to need to consider issues like this as we go through this chapter, considering the Great Depression, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, and the New Deal. Black Tuesday and the stock market crash are usually considered the beginning of the Great Depression. And while I, I will su suggest to some extent in this lecture that the stock market crash and the Great Depression are two distinct things and that we might possibly have had a stock market crash without a Great Depression, uh, in this case they do come to be historically linked. And so uh, we're going to discuss the nature of the stock market crash itself as, uh, as something of a, a prelude to the discussion of the Great Depression on the whole. And for the moment, let me just remind you of some of the features of the stock market or some of its qualities as we reached the end of the 1920s. And of course, just as a reminder, the 1920s are considered one of the great ages of prosperity in our nation's history. So as we're reaching the end of the 1920s, the country has been uh, sort of roaring along in uh, great prosperity for at least five or six years. So what sorts of things lead us into the stock market crash? Well, in terms of production, uh, I talked about the uh, greatly in improved efficiency and um, productivity in um, the factories and even in the fields and farmers throughout uh, the 1920s. And so production was not a problem in the sense that we were certainly producing um, plenty of products and automobiles were rolling off the production lines and refrigerators and appliances. But as we will discuss in a little bit more detail shortly, uh, if there is a problem in this, it is overproduction. Uh, 
uh, as these products continue just churning off of the production line and continue pouring out of the factories, if there's a problem, it is that uh, we struggle to find enough consumers and enough people to purchase these items, especially when you think about big ticket or large items like, well, certainly like homes, but also like automobiles or like refrigerators. Uh, how many of these things does any one person need or any one family need? Um, and so most Americans, as we're reaching the end of the 1920s, or certainly many Americans, have already bought their car. They've already bought their refrigerator. And so demand is beginning to sag a little bit. A somewhat related feature to this is uh, that during the 1920s, the nation maintained very high tariffs. Uh, and a tariff might seem like a complicated uh, idea, but all it is is simply a tax on import goods. In other words, if uh, someone in Spain is trying to sell their goods here in the United States, when they are shipped over, uh, a tax is automatically added to them, uh, which of course will end up raising the price of those import goods. And one of the things that a tariff does is it protects domestic products. If you've got uh, a bushel of corn that was uh, grown and harvested in the United States, and then you have a bushel of corn that was grown and harvested in Canada, and we have to add an artificial tax to the goods from Canada, well, you're more likely going to buy the domestic um, product. And certainly as uh, the United States is um, going along through the very um, productive and prosperous 1920s, high tariffs were a good thing, or seemed to be a good thing. What we will find, though, as with production, with tariffs, a high tariff comes to be a problem as the economy begins to fail and as we're sinking into the Great Depression. Because one of the things that we might have benefited from was uh, greater competition, lower prices across the board, but also foreign companies and foreign uh, people and nations purchasing more of our goods. And more often than not, when we uh, install high tariffs against foreign goods, those foreign nations do the same things against us. In other words, American goods are going to be artificially high in price abroad. We'll talk more about tariffs later. A third factor that we discussed in terms of the 1920s economy was the greater extension of credit. Uh, it was easier for more and more Americans to borrow money to purchase these big items that they needed, like cars, refrigerators, and so on. Uh, credit in and of itself is a, a necessary thing. I, I'm not inclined to say whether good or bad, but it's a vital ingredient in our nation's economy because, as I described in the lecture about the 1920s, Without these kinds of loans and without this kind of credit, how many of us could afford to buy an automobile uh, just with the cash in our pocket or even an item like a refrigerator or some of these larger items? Uh, so credit in and of itself is not necessarily a bad thing. But once again, what we will see is that as the economy begins to fail, as people are losing their jobs, as their pay wages are declining, uh, more and more Americans find it harder to pay off those debts. And of course, there, are, there can be severe consequences in situations like that. A final thing that I will just remind you is that not everyone participated in the prosperity and the sort of roaring times of the 1920s, and in particular farmers. I think I described to you in that earlier chapter that farmers enjoyed a period of prosperity during World War I, uh, when so much of the rest of the world was uh, in ruins or struggling, so there was very high demand for American farm goods. But with the end of the war, that demand uh, being eased, what we see is um, more and more of these farmers struggling to sell the products that they are growing and raising. And so farm prices begin to drop. And in effect, the farmers of this country, um, for them, the Great Depression begins 10 years earlier than the Great Depression begins for the rest of the country. Really throughout the 1920s, uh, farmers are living in a depressed circumstance. So if there's a theme in all of these elements, 
it is that in hindsight, and with the benefit of hindsight, we realize that the prosperity of the 20s was, if not completely a mirage, it was in some ways fragile. A lot of the elements that went into the prosperity of the 1920s uh, actually leave us on very shaky ground, uh, and ground that we will see when times begin to um, decline, uh, the ground just shifts and falters away beneath us, and the economy uh, crumbles. Let's think a little bit more specifically about the stock market itself in the late 1920s. Uh, the market, of course, had enjoyed one of its greatest periods of prosperity. And we will look at a few charts later, but if you consult any kind of historic uh, chart measuring the stock market, you'll notice that the period of the late 1920s, uh, 1928, 1929, is truly one of the, the greatest spikes in the stock market in all of its history. Uh, and yet again, what we come to, to realize in hindsight is that even the inflated um, stock market was somewhat artificial and, and based on uh, factors that really didn't hold up under thorough scrutiny. So we look back in hindsight and, and realize that the market was artificially inflated, that stock prices were too high, and yet we've also got the Washington Post predicting continued good times and continued prosperity. So these things are much more clear with the benefit of hindsight. We know that a stock market crash is coming. Uh, of course, people living at that time didn't know, and so there's, there's a part of us that might be tempted to wonder, why didn't people realize it at that time? Why didn't people get out um, before the market crashed? Uh, these are very difficult questions to answer. The stock market is, even today, it's very difficult to predict. If it was easy, we would all be rolling in dough. Everybody would make fortunes investing in the stock market. But it's a very complicated thing. There are lots of factors going into it. And in some ways, it was even more complicated in the 1920s to predict the stock market and to try to understand what made stock prices go up or down. Um, so let's look at a few of the elements of this inflated stock market. One of them is something that we, we know as margin buying or buying on margin. It's still something you can do today, although people do it uh, with a great deal of caution. And all this is is really another form of credit or borrowing money. Uh, when you borrow money for a home, we call it a mortgage. When you borrow money to invest it in the stock market, we call it margin. Uh, so essentially you are taking out a loan from the bank and you are putting that money directly into the stock market. What happens when you do this? Well, in the atmosphere of the late 1920s, people were observing the stock market, which was doing nothing but going up and up and up. And so th the thought is running through many people's minds. Well, why would you not borrow money and put it in the stock market? So let's just go through a case a example uh, so you understand what this means. Let's say you know, the stock market is going up, so you take out a margin loan. You borrow, say, $1,000 from the bank. You purchase stock with it. The stock is doing nothing but going up, and so let's say in a couple of weeks or months, the stock price has doubled. Well, you could at that point then sell the stock, pay back whatever you borrowed, and since it doubled, you've got an equal amount of money that's now yours. It's profit. It's free money. And so that was what people were considering at that time, that there was just free money to be had by doing this. However, we have to consider the other possibility. And this is where so many Americans uh, kind of fell into a trap by buying on margin. Let's say you borrow that $1,000 from the bank. Remember, this is money you don't have. So you're borrowing the money. Uh, you put that $1,000 into stock, and then the market crashes. And in a couple of weeks, let's say that $1,000 uh, that you put into the stock market, now that stock is only worth 500 And so now you've got a problem. Uh, you've got to wrestle with that. And we'll come back in just a few moments and, and consider what happens in a case like that. But so many people were buying on margin because the market was going up and up and up.
Another feature of the market in the late 1920s was speculation. Uh, the idea being that you didn't have to really know anything about the companies you were buying. You could just throw darts at a wall and pick any stock and that uh, they would go up and up and up. Robert La Follette, we've already met him, one of the uh, very prominent um, politicians of his era, called it the great American evil of stock exchange gambling. So there is this sense that speculation is a bad thing and that it's gambling. And actually, if you look at the cartoon there on the right, the poor sap uh, in the picture who's being dragged along is the speculator. Well, what is dragging him along is the bull market. This is a good thing, the stock market on the rise. And yet, if you're speculating, you're just sort of guessing and gambling, and you're going to be um, dragged along helplessly. I would add, I mean, we do look back on this and, and hold the speculators and these sort of gamblers in low regard. But let me just add that essentially everyone who was investing in the stock market in the 20s was speculating, was guessing. And the reason for that is that information uh, was so much more difficult to come by in the 1920s. Um, a lot uh, it, considered today, if you wanted to buy stock in a company today, how would you research the market and the different companies and the stocks? Well, you get on the Internet, you go to Google, you go to the company's website. All of the financial records are there, down to the penny uh, for the entire history of the company. You can track down, in a matter of moments, uh, everything you want to know about how that company is spending money, making money, and so on. Virtually none of that information would have been readily available in the 1920s. Of course, remember, we don't have the Internet, but aside from that... Uh, you didn't have the regulations that we have now. And we have those regulations precisely because of the stock market crash and the Great Depression. So companies didn't have to report their earnings regularly. Uh, they routinely falsified whatever company reports they did produce. And so even experts, even bankers and people uh, involved in the industry had very little idea what really was going on behind closed doors with a lot of these businesses. So we were all speculating in one way or another. And so what we find is by the end of the 1920s, there are many, many stocks and companies whose stock prices are overvalued. Now, again, if you and I could nail down what exactly this means, what stocks were overvalued, how overvalued were they, what should the proper price have been, these are the kind of things that could make you a lot of money today if you understood how to do that. So there's a lot of this that's just sort of intuitive. Uh, you kind of know it when you see it, that a stock price is overblown. And again, we know it much more clearly in hindsight than people did at that time. But many of the prices uh, were overly high. They were inflated. Um, and some of the big industries at that time whose prices were... Uh, in hindsight, we know too high were industries like the utilities, the railroads, radio in particular. We think you know, radio at that time was kind of like the Internet of today or the computer companies of today or satellite companies today. As just one example, the RCA Victor company, which was the leading radio company, you could purchase a share of RCA stock in 1911 for eleven dollars if you had the fortune to hold on to that one share of stock until 1928 you could have sold it for four hundred and fifty dollars and i would just point out that that's not even getting all the way to 1929 when some of the greatest gains took place that same share might have been five or six hundred dollars um, by 1929 now is this an inflated price it seems to be so. The numbers on the page are impressive. On the other hand, this was the Google of its day. This was the Facebook or the Microsoft of its day. Surely, the stock of a company like this warrants an impressive gain. But we look back in hindsight and understand that these kinds of gains were too much, too high. And there were dozens and dozens, even hundreds of other companies with similarly lofty uh, stock prices. Uh, 
And we understand again in hindsight that uh, the market was due for a correction. And in fact, that is exactly what happened. The bubble bursts and the stock market came crashing down. The market actually peaked in September on uh, September 3rd. Um, we'll talk in a few moments about the Dow Jones Industrial, which is a measure of the value of the stock market. And these days, the Dow Jones Industrial is uh, somewhere in the 14,000s or approaching 15,000. On September 3rd, 1929, the market peaked. The Dow Jones uh, measure peaked at 381. So for our mentality, that's an extremely low number anyway. That was the peak on September 3rd. It then sort of chopped around a little bit, uh, had its ups and downs until October 24th, 1929, when stock prices tumbled. And that date has been called Black Thursday. Uh, over the next couple of days, big-time bankers and investors, J.P. Morgan and others who were multi-multi-millionaires, poured money into the stock market to try to prop up uh, stock prices. Um, there's a fairly simple relationship governing the stock market, which is supply and demand. If people are buying stocks, the prices go up. If people are selling stocks, the prices go down. And so wealthy people were trying to buy and buy and buy, which would, we would hope, would prop up the prices of stocks or keep the prices going up. Um, but it was not enough. And on October 29th, Black Tuesday, which I described at the beginning of the lecture, uh, stock prices plummeted. Um, more than 16 million shares of stock were sold. And essentially you have visions of the uh, men on the trading floor you know, selling, 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 but no one is buying or very few people are buying. And so what's the price going to be low enough where people will start buying again? The reaction you see in the pictures represented on the screen, the bottom is kind of the shocked and overwhelmed um, trading floor of the stock market at the aftermath of this. And even though the picture is very kind of grainy and hazy, you can almost imagine the uh, sheer shock going through the, the minds of the people there. And on the right, a cartoon or picture indicating, uh, in essence, the end of the world. This is the uh, apocalypse when the stock market has crashed.